Uh, been in a series here these last few weeks about who to believe. If you ever ask yourself, I don't know if I can believe that. Turn on the TV and turn on the news and watch politicians speak. Was it, I think it was Reagan that's quoted was saying, if you tell if a politician's lying, when his lips are moving. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes, you know, you hear things and you, in this day and age, it seems like you don't know who to believe because the, the playing field is level. You don't have to be CBS or ABC. You can have a smartphone. And you have access to a platform. And so you've got opinions, and, and opinions are fine. But a lot of times they masquerade as the truth. And we find ourselves thinking, I'm not quite sure who to believe. Well, I'm probably not going to be able to help you out politically or maybe even with your neighbor. But I can help you out when people come claiming to speak for Jesus. They come claiming to have a word from God. We do have something. We are not left alone. We have the Word of God, and the Word of God has proven itself many, many times. You know, of all of the uh, pieces of literature that we have, there's no more, yeah, how do I want to say that? There's no more prolific copies of the Bible in any other book. There, there have been so many manuscripts that were hand copied through the years, and only slight variations, and that's why we have so many different translations of the Bible, different schools of thought and translation, but even the differences are so minor. It's amazing for a lot of the Old Testament books when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls and realized that it was almost just exactly. And you got to think that these were hand copied through the years. It's just amazing how the Word of God stands true. And even more so, when you place your trust in it and you accept it by faith, and God has a way of coming around the other side and confirming these things in our lives. So, I don't have any more intelligence or secret knowledge to give you except the Word of God. But in John the Apostle's day, toward the end of his life, probably around 85 A.D., before the close of the first century, he was the only living apostle that walked with Christ. And he had some things that he wanted to make sure people understood because there were these people that were coming and they were claiming to have secret knowledge from God. And they're claiming to know more than the people who walked with Jesus. And John's going, excuse me, I'm over here. I was there. I was at the foot of the cross when Jesus was crucified. I cared for his mother in Ephesus. I lived all my life through, got revelation from God on the island of Patmos and he says, I want to set the record straight. Now, as we get a little bit older, we want to document some things, and we want to write things down, and we want to make sure to pass things on to our family. And I believe this is the attitude in which John the Apostle was writing when he wrote what we know as First John. And he wrote three epistles. He wrote a gospel that bears his name and the book of Revelation. So he has a lot written down, and a common theme from all of John's writings is love, for God so loved the world, right? So, we're going to look in chapter 4 this week, 1 John, and I've uh, been using different translations each week, using the New Living Translation today, one of my favorites. And here's the first verse, dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God, for there are many false prophets in the world. There were false prophets in John's day when he wrote this letter. And there have been false prophets through history, and there are some today. Although I always like to add a disclaimer, which I'll do in just a moment. But before I do that, let me give you some examples through history. Think about it. We've had in our lifetimes, in some of our lifetimes anyway, I got to be careful when I say that since I passed 60 last year. Uh, but in some of our lifetimes, cult leaders like David Koresh and the Branch Davidians, you know, we've had people like Jim Jones, the People's Temple, and Marshall Applewhite, Heaven's Gate. There have always been those that have redefined Jesus, who have taken the historical Jesus, but they've strayed from the apostles' testimony of Jesus. History is important. 
When we take John, for example, there were early church fathers that, that knew John and testified that, yes, he is the one that wrote this letter. We don't just kind of blindly assume that this was written by the Apostle John. We have extra biblical evidence historically that this is the John. So when we hear what John is writing to the early church in the first century, we can also know that here's a man that walked with Jesus. Here's a man that was eyewitness of his miracles. Here's a man that was eyewitness of his death, his resurrection, his ascension, the Holy Spirit coming at Pentecost. Just think about what this one man experienced in his life and how God kept him all through his life, even when he was exiled on Patmos, and brought him back, uh, we believe anyway, into Ephesus. Thirty years before this letter was written, Paul the Apostle wrote to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 11. I'm going to paraphrase it. Paraphrase it. Paul writes, you people, <laughs> someone comes to you preaching another Jesus, and you believe him. What, are you stupid? I mean, he didn't write that, but I, just, I think probably what he was thinking. You guys put up with it. You believe it. What's your problem? Another Jesus. Of course, there's only one. But people have sought to redefine him. Some people have sought to reinvent him. Some of them go to church. But the Jesus of the Bible is the true Jesus, fully God and fully man. Yeah. See, in John's day, there were people going around teaching that Jesus did not actually have a physical body, that he did not physically die on the cross that he did not physically rise from the dead. And I think it's interesting, while those in John's day were claiming he didn't have a physical body, a lot of people today, they have no problem with the physical body. They have a problem with him being the Son of God. We have, so many have said Jesus was a good man, that he was a good teacher, that he is a way. Well, in John's day, they denied the physical, and today they deny the spiritual. He's both. He's 200%. And I say it over and over again, and I'm probably going to keep saying it as long as I have breath. If Jesus was not fully God and fully man, he would not have the qualifications necessary to provide forgiveness for you and for me, and the ability for us to be transformed into new creations. Yes. You've got to have both. And if there's another person in history who walked the earth with those qualifications, I'd like to hear it. Because then we can have an even conversation about how Jesus may not be the only way. But there's no one else that ever had the qualifications that lived a sinless life, but gave his life as payment for sin. Amen. The, uh, the teachers in Jesus, or teachers in John's day, who were denying the physical aspects of Christ, said that all physical didn't matter. As a matter of fact, all physical was evil. So it didn't matter. Well, that's kind of convenient, because then what happens, it gives you license to do whatever you want in your physical body. The physical matters to God. He expects us to live holy. Now, we can't do that in our own efforts and design, but that's why we talk about being transformed into the kind of people that do desire to live for Jesus. We're not just keeping rules and regulations. He changes our heart, right? So that we can do what pleases God, and where no one's going to be consistent 100% of the time, but we certainly are able to live above the power and authority of sin in our lives. So no matter whether we're talking about Corinth in Paul's day, or whether we're talking about the Ephesus uh, region in John's day, or whether we're talking maybe in the 20th century about people like David Koresh, or uh, People's Temple, or Heaven's Gate, or any number of subtle perversions of Jesus in our day, the fact is you got to be on guard against false teaching. Things that maybe sound or look good on the surface, you can get up and sound all religious and say things 
and make it sound like it ought to be spiritual and, and mean absolutely nothing. We have to be on guard against things that sound good, but maybe under further investigation they are wrong. And we got to stay on track, and we can't get sidetracked. And the best way to not get sidetracked and not get taken in by the counterfeit is to know the genuine. When we get too caught up on finding counterfeits, we'll find counterfeits around every corner. And that's not right either. That's a critical spirit. And there's nothing that will divide a church faster than a critical spirit. Most critics flap their gums about things they know nothing about. Let's not be that. Let's be educated. We've got 66 books and 1,189 chapters in the Word of God that can teach us what sound teaching is and what it's not. Many people stumble over the real Jesus. Sometimes He's the fly in the ointment. Sometimes He's the wrench in the gears. He's the stumbling block. Sometimes the real Jesus messes with our old-time religion. Sometimes the real Jesus reigns on our parade or is a party pooper. Well, sometimes we have to accept what the real Jesus, the conviction that the Holy Spirit brings. Sometimes it means God is trying to correct us. He's trying to get us back on track. Either Jesus is the only way or He isn't. Either He is who He and the apostles said He was and is, or we're without hope. It's up to us to know the real Jesus first and foremost, and also what the signs of the false teachers would be. And we're not left alone on this. This is our key verse today. Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God, for there are many false prophets in the world. Certainly, if that was true in the 80s A.D., it's certainly true today. The King James uh, renders this a little differently. For some of you who grew up with the King James, uh, try the spirits to see if they are of God. Uh, the, the New King James, the NIV, ESV, and others say, test the spirits. And I think that's important to remember because we're not testing the people. We're not, we have to be careful about judging intents of the heart. But we have to, to be discerning of the spirit that's at work because there are many spirits that have gone out into the world. Now, a lot of people have used this very verse of Scripture to condemn a whole lot of sincere biblical teachers uh, and groups of people. They've administered the wrong test. Maybe they've administered the test of preference or opinion or tradition, you know, because one person doesn't follow my made-up rules, they must be wrong. Right? So, the, the Pharisees in Jesus' day did this. They, they, they got the rules and the, the law of the law of God, and it wasn't, it's like, that's not enough to follow, we'd like to make some more, just so we could say we follow them. And if it's stuff that God never spoke on, we may follow the rules, but you think that impresses God? You know, that's the whole everybody knows thing. Well, everybody knows you don't do this in church. Everybody knows. You know, there's very little in the Bible about what we're doing right now. There's very little about pews or chairs or carpet or sound systems or songs or any of that stuff. And it's what most people stumble over. And when someone comes along that sings a different song or uses a different translation or has a different length of service or blah, 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 they will label them as false teachers. Don't do that. We have a much higher standard than our own feel-good or our own emotions or our own memories or what Grandma did, and there may be nothing wrong with what Grandma did, but let's not make Scripture out of it. Right? God often challenges our old-time religion with the truth of His Word. If you choose religion over the Word of God, it doesn't make you a disciple. It makes you a Pharisee. Nothing wrong with religion. It's not a bad word. We all have it, whether we want to think we do or not. We all have comfort zones. We all have things that we do. We like that fact that we're going to come in here. We're going to have 15 minutes of prayer time. 
We're going to start at 10 o'clock. There's going to be singing. There's going to be announcements. By the way, Sarah is awesome at what she does. Thank you very much. You don't ever have to worry. I know I'm embarrassing her. You don't ever have to worry about going down another path. It's nice to have people that you can trust. Amen. And uh, we've got a lot of those kind of people here. But, and, and, and sometimes, if we're not careful, we can get into a rut, which is why we usually don't do the same thing week after week on purpose so we don't start worshiping the way we do things. But it's easy to fall into. But with all of that said, there are most certainly is error in believing everything that comes down the pike. We have to understand the standards of the Word of God. Because today there's a whole lot coming down the pike. And if you believe everything that you hear, then you're not being a responsible disciple. We need to be discerning. In our age of instant communication and fake news, fake news just isn't political. Sometimes that's in the church too. Right? Right? We have to understand some people see those as the same thing, and that's unfortunate. But we have to test the spirits behind what is being done to see if they are of God. It's more than just how does this make you feel, right? So, I mentioned earlier, we got to watch being judgmental. Uh, The world tells us we are judgmental a lot of times if we come down on sin. That's really not being judgmental because if God's already made the judgment call, we're not being judgmental. We're not condemning people, right? At the, the thing the Bible speaks about, about not judging, is presuming to know what's in somebody else's heart. Right. So if this is what we are on guard against, and we never want to presume or assume that we know what's in somebody else's heart, how do we do this? How do we do this if we're not going to be judgmental? Well, there's good thing we have some scripture because we're going to find out some things that we can do so that we are not assuming, so that we're not judging, and so that we're not condemning the person, but rather we're considering the spirit that's at work. We know the difference, right? We should know the difference. So it's more than just how does this make you feel. It's knowing does the teaching survive the bright light and authority of scripture? That's the primary reason that, we, that we're able to make a discerning uh, conclusion on teaching. Does it survive the bright light of Scripture? What principles are they proclaiming? Is what they are teaching godly. So in, in this passage we're going to look at today, we're actually going to get to it here. Now I'm talking too much, sorry. Um, that's why I have notes to try to avoid the rabbit trails, but sometimes they come up anyway. You just can't help it. So, uh, in this passage of Scripture, just these six verses that we're going to look at, uh, there's two practical ways how you can know who and what to believe. So, uh, along with these two tests, we're going to have an assurance for those who are born again today. So, first I want to look at verses 2 and 3 in uh, 1 John 4. This is how we know if they have the Spirit of God. If a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in a real body, that person has the Spirit of God. But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the Spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. So there's test one. If, if they acknowledge the truth about Jesus. And in this case, from what I told you before, you can understand why John is singling out the fact that if they acknowledge that Jesus came in a real body. Scripture has application for when it was written, and it has application for us today. If we don't understand what it meant to the first readers or the first hearers, we're not going to get the full understanding of what it means today. This is just good hermeneutics, understanding Scripture. It's all inspired by God. It's all God-breathed. But context is important. And in this case, we see that stand head and shoulders above the text, right? He is saying, listen, you, 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 you children, you kids of mine, if someone comes along and denies the fact that Jesus came in a real body, their teaching is false. Well, that had an application for their day with those who were coming and claiming superior knowledge about Jesus. So he said that's the first thing. 
uh, we, can, we can step back from that a little bit today and say, well, why does that matter today? Without a body, there's no sacrifice. The Bible is clear that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Now, that looks a little strange maybe to a world that's looking upon us and looking for reasons to say that we're off the deep end, and I don't know, maybe we are, but I'd rather be off the deep end than be on the wrong end. Anyway, uh, but the sacrificial system that God established under Moses to show the, the severity of sin, and for years and years and years, people sacrificed animals, the best of the flock, in the temple. And it, it, all it did was kind of cover sin and, and, and put off judgment, right? So then in God's perfect time, Jesus comes, having no sin, but made that perfect sacrifice by dying on a cross. He shed his blood once and for all. No more sacrifices. We don't have bulls and goats coming in here to the altar and sacrificing him. Why would you do that when Jesus gave his life, right? Without a physical body, there could not have been a sacrifice, and Jesus would not be sufficient sacrifice for our sin. And it's hope of heaven that Jesus said in Acts, or, John, or Peter said about Jesus in Acts 4.12, no other name has been given among heaven by which we must be saved. Amen. Jesus is the only way. So the first test is what? What do they say about Jesus? What do they say about Jesus? Do they confess that Jesus was both divine and also man, he was 100% divine and 100% man. He was fully God, but he was fully man. That's the one litmus test. If the answer is yes, they have the Spirit of God, according to this passage. If the answer is no, they have the Spirit of Antichrist. Well, now, Antichrist, we think of someone who is coming at the end of all things. But the Spirit of Antichrist was already in the world then is already in the world now because anything that is against Jesus or is promoting another Jesus is the spirit of Antichrist. So that's the one spirit that we can identify. Test two is in verses five to six. Those people, talking about false teachers, those people belong to this world, so they speak from the world's viewpoint and the world listens to them. But we belong to God. And those who know God listen to us. If they do not belong to God, they do not listen to us. That is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. Verse 6 here. We belong to God. And those who know God listen to us. Well, who's we and us? Well, I think in this case, it's John and the apostles. The ones who walked with Jesus. Uh, the ones who should know what Jesus embodied in his earthly ministry. And he said, those who are in Christ, well, then they believe our message because they are the ones that delivered the message in the first place. I think it's awesome that we have this written record of one who walked with Jesus, and we can just read it and not really think about that. What what this means, we're reading words from someone who saw Jesus and walked with him and, and had a, a, a deep love for him, a, a brotherly love that, that had great bonds between them. And here we have the benefit of being able to read the words of John as recorded in Scripture. So this is part of the second test, is that do the teachings in question line up with the Word of God? Do they line up with the apostles' message? Do they line up with the gospel of Jesus Christ? And if they do, then we can see that it's of God. But if they only line up with human wisdom and understanding the world's viewpoint, well, then those teachings have to be rejected. When we say the world, and I don't want it to sound like sometimes people talk about the world as if they detest it. It's not, we don't detest the world. But there's a world viewpoint on things of God, and it makes no sense. Do you know what I'm talking about? It makes no sense. Why in the world do you come here week after week? Why do you give your money and your time? Why do you say giving your life to Jesus? They don't understand it because it doesn't make any sense from an anti-Christ viewpoint. But those who have been redeemed and been changed, we understand these things. And our allegiances have changed. So if the teachings that come down the pike 
hold up under scrutiny, not of tradition, not of human understanding and reasoning, but of the whole counsel of the Word of God, well, then we can receive those teachings as genuine. What are some things that hold up under scrutiny? Some, some biblical teachings about the Word, about Jesus. Well, His sinless life, that He was born of a virgin, that He rose again, uh, that He walked on earth in His resurrected body. How would that blow your mind? You're sitting in a locked room, and bang, there He is, but yet you can touch Him. That He ascended to heaven, and that He's coming again. Boy, there's an awful lot of stuff we can disagree on and still agree on that. People want to create camps as if they're false teachers because they sing worship songs and not hymns, or because they don't follow a certain order of worship, or we can get critical of those who do follow a liturgy and, and claim that it's false. What makes it false? Our tradition? No. You may find the attributes of Christ that I just read off to be basic understanding of Jesus. But to some people, them's fighting words. To claim exclusivity in an age of many, many choices. Jesus brings both peace and strife. And he always has. Jesus brings both unity and division. And he always has. He said in Matthew 10, 34, do not suppose that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. But the biblical Jesus, the Jesus of the apostles' testimony is the dividing line. And Jesus causes people to take up sides. Sometimes we might be accused of hate speech, claiming that Jesus is the only way. Sometimes the way some church people say it does sound hateful. Billy Graham's message uh, would not be received well today. Remember when the network covered the Billy Graham Crusades at 8 p.m.? That wouldn't work today, would it? So rather than, than lament what doesn't work, we need to let God be creative in us right. to find new ways to reach out. Skip the verse in this passage, if any of you might have noticed. I skipped it up for a reason because it's kind of sandwiched in between these two passages as an anxiety relief valve for the believer. And I'd like to look at that in just a minute. You know, some of you may worry about this. Some of you may have anxiety about who to believe and what to believe. You know what? We don't need to. There's no need. There's no need for us to, to have knee-jerk reactions to everything we hear and, and risk the danger of opening mouth and inserting foot, right? Fin there. I don't want to do that anymore. It doesn't taste good, you know? But we shouldn't have anxiety that causes us to have knee-jerk reactions. We should have the reactions of Jesus. Who, who, who did not hesitate to preach the hard truths, but yet sinners were attracted to him. It's the religious people that couldn't stand him. Gene, I've been talking to you a long time about doing this little artwork. One of these days, you know what? I hold off because I don't want people to get the wrong idea. Uh, down at the, the gym down here where they say uh, uh, judgment-free zone, I'd like to make that Pharisee-free zone and make a banner and put it on the wall in here. We love the Pharisees, but I just cannot let them cause division. And this is a Pharisee-free zone. I tell you what, we can all get Pharisaical sometimes when, when we're faced with things that are just a little different than what we're used to, but uh, that was a side trip, no charge for that. But anyway... Maybe one of these days I'll get brave and we'll make that thing up here. But we can have confidence. Listen, we don't have to be anxious about this. We can have confidence. We don't have to go out and find false teachers around every tree. We can know when we hear something whether it lines up 
with the Word of God. And here's this anxiety relief valve scripture, verse 4. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the Spirit who lives in you is greater than the Spirit who lives in the world. Isn't that something that we can take some comfort in this? Stop trying to make this about your intellect and make it about your faith. And then God will take your intellect, mix it with faith, and give you assurance. Most of the anxiety drugs that we have would go away. Most of the the knee-jerk reactions to things would all disappear. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. So what is the Spirit that lives in one who is born again? It's the Holy Spirit of God. It's the Holy Spirit of God who was present at creation when the Spirit hovered over the waters of the deep. The Holy Spirit that is all through the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit that was given and taken from the prophets as they spoke became the Holy Spirit that came to indwell all believers in Jesus Christ at Pentecost. And before Pentecost, Jesus with his disciples, you remember that? And Jesus was still in his resurrected body in John 20, and he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. This is a sign of what happens when we're born again. When you're born again, that Holy Spirit, you could not be born again without the Holy Spirit. That means that you get a fresh start. That means the slate is wiped clean. That God not only forgives, He forgets. Can I get an amen for that? Because we can't forget to think that God can forget our past and gives us a brand new start. And not only does He do that, He gives us the power to live holy lives. That's that Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. That Holy Spirit that authored the Word of God. That Holy Spirit that was present at creation. That Holy Spirit that indwells all believers and confirms His Word. The same Holy Spirit that authored the Word through men. Forty men over a period of 1,500 years. And if you take it in its entirety, it agrees with one another. You take a verse here and a verse there. You ever have anybody do that to you? You're not obligated to attend that argument. You can make it say anything you want. But the totality of the Word of God agrees with itself. There's no other book that's alive. We are not left on our own. We are not left to fend uh, for ourselves in our own power. And there's even more. And I want to challenge you today to pursue the even more. We've already talked about it. This is Pentecost Sunday. This is the Jesus had told the disciples when He ascended, don't leave town because I've got something you're going to need. It was more than that Holy Spirit that He breathed into them. There was a fullness that they needed to receive. Why? Because He had an incredible task for them. He has an incredible task for us. We need everything that we can take advantage of as born-again believers so that we can serve Him. There is no reason for Christians to live in fear of false teachers, none at all. We have the Word of God. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the fellowship of other believers. Lone Ranger Christianity is not a biblical thing. We need one another. How do I know who to believe? Well, you may not always be able to know who to believe in terms of politics or in your employment or the financial world or any of that stuff, but we can know who to believe when it comes to things of God. Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them or test the spirits behind what they say to see if the Spirit they have comes from God. For there are many false prophets who have come into the world. This is Pentecost Sunday. Penny means 50. Pentecost is an Old Testament harvest feast. 50 days after Passover in our Western Christian world, we celebrate it 50 days after Easter because uh, Christ's uh, arrest and trial and crucifixion and resurrection all happened during the Jewish Passover feast in God's perfect time. Pente means 50. 50 days after uh, the resurrection of Christ, the Holy Spirit came. 40 days, Jesus walked in His glorified body. 10 days, 
the believers met together in a prayer meeting, a 10-day prayer meeting, and they had no idea what was going to happen. They just knew that what was going to happen is something that they needed to be a part of. In Acts 1.8, Jesus uh, told his disciples before he ascended, he ascended, he said, don't leave town. Wait for the promise of the Father, and when the Holy Spirit comes, he will, uh, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you will receive power. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. How could we not ourselves wait for that power from on high that's still available today? People hold it at arm's length. People say, I've had uh, just enough. I don't want to be labeled as one of those crazy people. Hey, we're already crazy. You might as well go all the way. He has more than what you've experienced already. He has more for me than what I've experienced already. In Acts 2.4, I read it earlier, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. In Acts chapter 8, Philip, the, the, uh, the deacon Philip went to Samaria and led some people to Jesus. Peter and John came from First Assembly of God in Jerusalem and <laughs> laid hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. We read in Acts chapter 9 where Saul, the threat to the church, becomes Paul, the greatest apostle to the Gentiles. And Ananias comes and laid his hands on Paul, and something like scales fell from his eyes, and Paul could see with his eyes, and the Bible says he was also filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 10, Peter goes to a Gentile's house, Cornelius, a centurion, a Roman official preaches the gospel, and it says that before Peter could even give the altar call, the Holy Spirit fell on everybody in the room, and they spoke in tongues and praised God. We also read an account, Acts chapter 19, where Paul is making his third missionary journey. He stops in Ephesus, and there were 12 men who were disciples, and he said, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said, well, I don't know what you're talking about. Paul laid his hands upon them and says they received the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues and prophesied. When the Holy Spirit fills you, something happens. And it's not just emotion. It's not just gifts. It's not just, you know, people think we're all about speaking in tongues. Well, that's important. My personal life, my personal edification, if I don't know what to pray so many times, I need that heavenly language. I need that communication. But it's not all about tongues. It's about power. It's about power to witness for Jesus. Throughout history, even when history was quiet, if you look hard enough, you'll find evidences throughout history where people got a hold of this. Even maybe when The official church did not sanction it. People were getting a hold of this truth. And we see it in the last 150 years becoming more and more obvious. We we talk about the, the Pentecostal outpouring at the beginning of the 20th century where people started reclaiming this that, that had long been dormant in so many churches, and they were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And 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 the greatest evangelism and mission outreach the world has ever seen happened every, as a result of it. Fruit, fruit that you can't argue with. And you know what? God hasn't changed his mind. He wants everyone here to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you can remember a time when it happened to you, he wants you to experience it again. Because when we go through life, the things that we experience, and maybe even some of the false teachers that come our way, we get a little beat up, and we get a little anxious, and we we get a little burnt out, and we need to be rejuvenated. We need to be filled. And I thank God that he has a plan for every believer in the sound of my voice. I thank you that we cannot be saved without the Holy Spirit. I thank you that we cannot do the incredible deeds that he has us do without the power of the Holy Spirit. Because if we could, we would feel pretty confident in ourselves, wouldn't we? You know, we can come together like this and we can manage to put together a church service that sounds pretty good. But without the power of the Holy Spirit, it will not have the impact that it's supposed to have. We can go out and tell people about Jesus and what He's done for us, but without the power of the Holy Spirit, it's just not going to be the same. 
We need everything that God has for us today. And I would like everybody in this room to experience the power of God in their lives. Not to put a memory on a shelf. Not to claim a trophy. But that we could be changed and that we could tell a world that is hurting and looking for hope that Jesus is the answer.